friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, let me start by acknowledging the Kamach clan on whose lands we hold this meeting and say a special thank you to the Yothu Lindi Foundation for hosting us here over these special days uh, at Karma. I want to say that uh, I'm joined here with, by David Ritter, who's the head of Greenpeace Australia Pacific. Maybe, David, if you can stand, people know who you are. And David will be addressing you tomorrow, and, I, and he's keen to reach out to you. This is not his first time. He's been here before. And my colleague, Emma Gibson, who's our program director here. And it's, we just want to say how grateful we have been to be here since Friday, to listen, to learn, to engage, and dialogue uh, on a more f informal basis, as well as to attend the various functions. And I just want to say on a lighter note, coming from South Africa, and those of you who know the history of uh, uh, injustice in South Africa will know that in the old days in South Africa we used to have slogans like no normal sport in an abnormal society and we also had another slogan which said no uh, normal education in an abnormal society so the universities were racially segregated and so we went to universities but we never attended the graduation so we boycotted the graduation ceremonies and I got to tell you that when apartheid was defeated, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, some of you might have heard of, held this big graduation class for all those people who didn't attend the graduation ceremonies, and it was called the class of the struggle. So yesterday, I have to tell you, it was very, very moving to see the graduation ceremony of Yunga Pinga, and it did take me back to that moment and I've always felt that the struggles of people in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, in the global south and the struggles of indigenous peoples around the world have actually a lot in common. I'm a bit nervous speaking to you today because maybe I do it as an anecdote. I was speaking to folks in the United States recently and I was talking about how close we are to environmental collapse and therefore social collapse. So I was going on and saying, you know, on oceans, we have literally four decades to, within four decades, if we continue on the trajectory that we are, with the triple whammy that our oceans face of overfishing, dumping of toxics, including oil spills, and ocean acidification, which is a problem of more and more carbon, less and less forests, the excess carbons going into our oceans and actually destroying them and turning it into acid. Uh, and by the way, this is not even a Greenpeace statistic. This is Newsweek saying that in 40 years, uh, our oceans could be dead. And those of you who know Newsweek, it's not a particularly environmentally friendly left-wing or radical publication. Uh, then I went on to talk about forests. And, and with forests, as we sit here today, every two seconds, a forest the size of a football field will disappear. While many of our political leaders around the world have agreed that we have to stop deforestation as a solution to climate change, the reality is that all of this is happening. I'll come back to climate a little bit later, but so I went through all of the, these statistics and at the end of my speech, a person put up a hand in the audience and said, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, I said, yes, he's been one of my heroes since I was 15. And he said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? And I said, uh, I thought it was a trick question, so I was a bit tentative. I said, I have a dream. And she shouted back at me. She said, yes, it was called I have a dream. When you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare with the oceans getting destroyed <laughs> and so on. Uh, <laughs> and said, you know, how do you get people to be engaged. And I want to be honest with you, this is the real difficulty we have at the moment. Because we have a responsibility to speak truth to power. We have to call it as it is, however painful it is, however fast we are running out of time on the one hand. But we also have to do it in a way that energizes and engages and brings people into the fight that we absolutely, absolutely must have right now. So when I joined Greenpeace as an activist who came more from a development, poverty, uh, you know, human rights and, and gender equality background, I was amazed in my first week of on the job, I had to do lots of interviews with media from around the world, and the main question they were asking me in one way or the other 
well, Mr. Naidu, you have given up on you, you, you have given up almost you've sold out on the anti-poverty human rights and ge gender equality movements for the environment movement and i really struggled with this question i was getting it mainly from developed countries i should say but also from some developing country journalists and my answer was and that is the message of greenpeace here today is that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change and the struggle to ensure ecological sustainability must, can, and should be seen, and, and the struggle to end global poverty must, can, and, see, uh, and be seen as two sides of the same coin. We will fail both on addressing the injustice of poverty as well as the threat of climate change and other environmental problems if we don't connect them and understand how they both relate to each other. And this is the biggest problem that we have today with governance and how we are governed. Because if you think about how governments operate, they have line ministries, and the siloed approach to addressing social problems has to be broken, and we have to be able to understand how different issues intersect. And the women's movement decades ago gave us a wonderful concept, but a cumbersome word when they talked about the need for intersectionality. Anybody remembers that word, intersectionality? Okay, there's some people here yeah, who, like me, sadly read that particular pamphlet from the feminist movement. The, 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 the important thing about it is the women's movement said we will not advance gender if we don't understand how gender intersects with race, class, ability, religion. And similarly, for any movement, whether you're from the human rights side, the poverty side, or as we are at Greenpeace, from the environment side, we have to ask that question. And that is why we are working harder and harder today to work in partnership and in alliance with uh, a broad spectrum of people across the world, and particularly with indigenous peoples. And our message is quite clear, that we need to ensure that there is more power and more voice and more participation and more space for indigenous peoples, but also more power, more voice for people as a whole, because today we have to question the nature of the democracy that we find ourselves in. In far too many countries in the world today, we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. If you take the United States today, which sees itself as a promoter of democracy to the world, I would describe the United States today as the best democracy money can buy. And when you unpack which money buys that democracy, it's oil, it's coal, it's nuclear, it's military, uh, and so on. And that is why today in the United States, for every member of Congress, there is a minimum of three and a maximum of eight full-time lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry to make sure no climate legislation passes in the United States. Sadly, yeah, in, the United, uh, in Australia as well, I must respectfully say to you that Prime Minister Abbott, which I just heard I share at least one thing in common with him, that we both were Rhodes Scholars at Oxford. Uh, I'm very happy I was looking for something that I could connect with him on. Uh, and... Uh, who, who, I should say, visited Garma three years ago as the leader of the opposition. Uh, good for him for doing that. But he is in the grip of the coal industry. Not only, by the way, the domestic corporate coal industry, but also the global corporate coal industry. Right now, we are being crushed as Greenpeace in India by a government that is coming after us because of the work that we are doing with communities living in forest um, forest-dependent communities to prevent some big coal expansion. That same company, run by a man called Mr. Adani, is the one who is going to destroy the Great Barrier Reef uh, in, in, in Australia. And so, so, so when, when Prime Minister Abbott says coal is good for humanity, then I have to say, what is the quality of democracy in, the United, in, in Australia? Let me be blunt with you. Because all the consensus from the science now, and there's no debate about the science. Even George W. Bush accepts that climate change is man-caused and that coal is a contributor to it. To have somebody to deny the science, right? In last year, we had the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the body that won the Nobel Peace Prize several years ago. It's the biggest scientific enterprise that we've had on this planet. Right? And they've told us 
that we have to leave, just last year in the current report, they've told us we have to leave 80% of known oil, oil, coal, and gas reserves where they are if we have to stand the chance to address climate change. So think about that. 80% of what we know that exists needs to stay in the ground if we have to have a chance to exist. So now I can see some of you are feeling as depressed as the woman in the United States who said, I have a nightmare. And I want to say to you, there is good news in my story. And here's the good news. We as environmentalists always say, save the planet. The good news is, don't worry about saving the planet. The planet actually does not need saving. You might be confused now. Because, let me explain what I mean. If we continue as we are, and warm up the planet as we are heading, because we are already, we have warmed the planet. You might have heard the figure of two degrees, that we can't have warming more than two degrees from the start of the industrial period when we started burning oil, coal, and gas. Anybody in the audience knows where we are from zero degrees towards that two degrees? We are at 0 0.8 degrees already. And at 0 0.8 degrees in the last decade, we have had more than a 100% increase in extreme weather events. And by the way, the people in the Pacific have actually paid a key, uh, uh, paid a huge price for that, as the, as the events in Vanuatu has just shown. So why I say don't worry about saving the planet, because if we continue on the trajectory and business as usual and half measures and baby steps and incremental tinkering to address this huge problem of climate change that we have ignored for too long, then even the World Bank and the IMF, again, not particularly revolutionary organizations, have actually said that we're heading for a six degree world and that we will be kaput. Meaning, basically, that on the trajectory we're currently on, we will warm up this planet to a point that humanity cannot exist. But the planet will still be here, we'll be gone. And in fact, to be blunt about it, once we're gone, you know, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, and so on. Right? So let's understand that this struggle is fundamentally about whether humanity can fashion a way to coexist in a mutually interdependent way with nature for centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, this struggle is fundamentally about securing our children and their children's future. And when you put it in that frame, we need to challenge every CEO of every company that's in a business area that's driving um, carbon pollution. And, and I, I, on an anecdotal basis, I should tell you that in Greenpeace negotiations with big companies, when we're having conflict with, with them, and when I sit down with CEOs of big companies, I always tell my staff, please, can you just find out what the person's family background is, and does he have children? And I can tell you, without fail, a CEO who's in his second, third, or fourth marriage with young children is much more susceptible to Greenpeace pressure than those that do not have young children. Uh, I've said it a bit of a light way, but we need to understand that we are running out of time. And for the people of the Pacific, particularly the people of small island states, I have to say that those of us who are following things closely feel a real sense of desperation because even the two degree target, people, small island states, particularly Pacific small island states, five years ago that when it was agreed in Copenhagen at that climate negotiation, where arguing for one and a half degrees, because they felt anything more than one and a half degrees was going to actually wipe out their existence. So Greenpeace in the Pacific, of course, uh, some of you might know, have quite a long history of engagement. And, and some of you might remember that just last month, we uh, acknowledged the, we marked the 30th anniversary of the sinking of a Greenpeace ship called Rainbow Warrior in Auckland by the French intelligence agents. And why they were doing that was because we were trying to stop nuclear testing in uh, the Pacific. So thankfully, nuclear testing stopped. We lost one of our colleagues who died in that incident, as you might remember. Uh, but the problem is the people in the Pacific uh, as a whole are vulnerable. And by the way, I would argue that of any developed country in the world, Australia is probably seeing a higher number of extreme weather events and climate-induced weather events compared to most other developed countries 
the United States has pockets where there's some quite serious impacts already, such as in California right now where drought is very serious. But, and that is why for those of us who look at Australia from the outside are mesmerized how there is so limited ad action. I mean, okay, Kevin Rudd, when he was prime minister, there was that carbon tax and that gave the world a lot of optimism. And by the way, that's the first attempt of any country to go for a carbon tax. And then, of course, things have shifted. And I appeal to Prime Minister Abbott to follow the science and to follow the long-term interests of the Australian people as a whole. And then you might wonder why our ship is called the Rainbow Warrior. The, the Rainbow Warrior is, uh, comes from a prophecy of the Cree people, the indigenous peoples of North America, or one of the indigenous communities in North America, where an elder woman called Eyes of Fire a century ago, more, said, there will come a time when the trees will disappear, the waters will turn black, where the fish will be dead in the sea and rivers. When that time comes, it will be a recognition that because of white man's greed, we have harmed the planet to a point where it's on the verge of destruction. And when that time comes, people across the world, irrespective of race, religion, caste, and so on, will come together to attempt to try and heal and rebuild the world, and they will be known as the warriors of the rainbow. So I say that story to say that you know, Greenpeace has a history of connection with indigenous people, but I want to be very honest and upfront with you to say that the relationship between Greenpeace and indigenous peoples historically has not been all smooth. Some of our actions, particularly in China, sorry, particularly in Canada and Greenland, cause hurt and offense historically. And uh, Greenpeace has, under my leadership in the last couple of years, I have explicitly and unequivocally apologized for some of those relationships. And we are on a path now of working more closely. So most of the battles that we are fighting in the Amazon, um, in the Congo Basin forests, uh, in the Arctic, uh, and so on, all of these struggles are in partnership and engagement and consultation and listening with uh, indigenous peoples who live there and who are impacted. And that is essentially what we want to achieve here in Australia and are already working constructively, but we are here to try and take it to a different level. And what we understand is that while we can say we support the rights of indigenous peoples, that includes recognizing the right and necessity for indigenous peoples to engage in sustainable e economic development in a contemporary sense. Greenpeace understands that traditions evolve and change, but in any event, we respect and support the right and the imperative for indigenous peoples to participate in the full breadth of economic life. So I want to ask for, the, for a video, to, uh, sorry, uh, a PowerPoint slide to be shown, because I want to just quickly say that, yeah, just to be clear, sorry, where is this? <laughs> okay, while you, the board of Greenpeace Australia, uh, Pacific, uh, has just adopted a resolution, and these are the seven points that they make. I won't walk you through all of them, but just to say, um, these include affirming that under international law, indigenous peoples have the right to free, prior, and informed consent for decisions that will affect their interests, including any development on traditional territory as recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We also recognize the right of indigenous peoples to carry out traditional activities on their traditional territories. So for example, when I said we had caused offense at some point, so in Alaska, for example, there is a, a very uh, long-standing whale hunt where actually not a large number, of, and it's not commercial, it's done in a very spiritual way and so on. And whereas in the early days, Greenpeace had just a blanket thing that, you know, we oppose anybody who, who touches whales. That policy has changed, and, and now we are working very closely with, uh, with communities like that in Canada and elsewhere uh, in the world. So I want that to stay up there so that you can actually familiarize yourself with it. 
and uh, both Emma and David Ritter are here uh, to, to have further conversations with you. But I want to just return to what a very prominent Australian woman called Sharon Burrows, who now heads up the global trade union movement, the first woman, by the way, to head up the global trade union movement, Sharon Burrows. She was also, I think, the head of the ACTU year before she took that role. And we were having a meeting with the Secretary General of the United Nations a few years ago in Rio, during the Rio Plus 20 conference. And in that meeting, it was very interesting because we, we were talking about cl the, the real threat of climate change. And uh, while we were talking, you could see that the Ban Ki-moon was checking his notes, you know, to see, okay, is this the Greenpeace person or is this the trade union person? Because she was so strong and so on. And, and so she said, says, and now she says it all over the world, she said, as a trade unionist, as a mother, and as a parent, uh, uh, yeah, well, sorry, let me get this right. She says, as a trade unionist, my job is to fight for, for jobs and decent work. But as a parent, as a human being, uh, I, I have to recognize, Mr. Secretary General, I have to fight climate change very hard because they are, and, and this is the quotation, and I'll tell you this is the most chilling one-liner on climate to, as a wake-up call. She says, because as a trade unionist, and a human being, I realize there are no jobs on a dead planet. So I want to end now by saying that Martin Luther King gave a speech in the late 60s where he said, in modern child psychology, we have a very powerful term called maladjusted. Now, all of us don't want to suffer from schizophrenia and other mental problems. But my dear friends, he said, as I come to the end of the speech, I want to say to you, I refuse to be well-adjusted to racial prejudice. I refuse to be well-adjusted to religious bigotry. And I refuse to be well-adjusted to the idea that we will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when God's children are trapped in an airtight air cage of poverty. I want to suggest to you, as I begin to conclude, that far too many of us, I include myself in that, have become too well adjusted to absolute abnormality. Absolute abnormality. A level of inequality between, within every nation and between rich and poor nations that is completely unacceptable. A notion of what constitutes human happiness, which is consume, 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 uh, you know, has become the norm. You know, we have to begin to ask some fundamental questions when we are told that we are living at the moment as if we are living on one and a half planets, meaning what we are taking from the planet is as if we, we are already on one and a half planets. We are told that if everybody in the world has to live as, for example, as mainstream Australia lives, or mainstream US lives, and the uh, elites in developing countries live, that we'll need between five and eight planets. So we have to address such things as what constitutes human happiness, what constitutes meaningful consumption, and how do we balance the world. So I want to say that we in a time now where incremental change won't cut it. We have to be bold and courageous. And as Nelson Mandela said, courage is not the absence of fear, but courage is the ability to overcome it. And today, the first courage we have to have is the courage to believe that we can create a different kind of world, a more just world, and a world that we can hand over to our children so that when our children ask us 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, when the science said you'll need it to change, what did you all do? Let's hope we'll be able to say to them, it was difficult, it was challenging, we changed, and we secured your future. Thank you very much.